So it brings us to the original question. So it brings us to the original question. Now that the Superior Court has said Wanjiku is the only person who can initiate popular initiative, and Wanjiku cannot be assisted by any state organ, but Wanjiku cannot go to the Supreme Court. How does Wanjiku get advice on whether what they want to change is basic structure or not? That is the conundrum. My Lord, the second point before I come to on history submitted by my learned friend Mr. Paul Mangi. Only two points, my Lord. One is that an analysis of the history as given suggests that the history of our constitution making was a continuum that from when it started to when we ended up with the constitution of Kenya 2010, it was a continuous process. And therefore, the court indiscriminately refers to bits and pieces in that process without acknowledging that our constitution making was a disjointed process where at times the documents that were presented were rejected, including in a referendum in 2005. And therefore, when you refer to documents and arguments made before, you must be very careful because you could be referring to things that were expressly rejected by Kenyans. And it is important to note, and Paul Mwangi pointed out this yesterday, that ultimately, in terms of construing the Constitution of Kenya 2010, the starting point ought to be the Constitution and the report of the Committee of Experts and the submissions thereof because it's what resulted in the new constitution. Many processes before that died at stillbirth or died at the hands of Kenyans. And you cannot easily refer to them as if they are what instructed the ultimate text of the constitution. And the second and last point on it, my Lord, is that the decision intentionally diminishes the role of political consensus and suggests that the document that we have was entirely a result of the decisions of Kenyans. My Lord, just to one example, ultimately the most contentious issue in constitution making was the system of government, the type of executive we are to have. And today, my Lord, we have a presidential system, almost pure presidential system. My Lord, as you will see in the report of the Committee of Experts, and I invite you to look at volume 4, page 1551, paragraph 6.1.5, and also page 1604.8.1. My Lord, it makes very clear, without having to read it right now, the Committee of Experts notes there that while the harmonized draft was inclined towards a parliamentary hybrid, the Parliamentary Select Committee, in its wisdom, decided to settle for a presidential system. The Committee of Experts, therefore, settled on that presidential system as a result of political compromise, not because the people of Kenya wanted it. That intentional diminishing of the role of political compromise therefore warps the history that is captured. Indeed, my Lord, we note that in that entire history, one of the organs that are no, is not mentioned even once is the Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitution Making. And yet it was one of the organs of review in the 2008 Act, and it played a fundamental role in birthing the Constitution. Well, let me come back to popular initiative. I want to make some seven quick points on this. Who are the promoters? You know, we wish to submit on this that against all evidence which was not controverted that the promoters if this initiative 
was Honorable Dennis Waweru and Honorable Junet Mohammed. The court insists on finding that His Excellency President Uhuru Mugai Kenyatta was the promoter of this initiative against all evidence. We want to submit categorically that the promoters of the popular initiative we are talking about in this case were the two gentlemen we have mentioned. But because anyone is allowed to support any person in this country, including the president, including this court, can support the initiative in the words of Article 257. Question, the court does not post. 315 pages. My Lord, I invite you to look at Volume 5, page 2116 to 2158, especially at page 2158. It clearly shows that it is an initiative, the Building Bridges Initiative. And the word initiative there is used because those are the words of Article 257. It's an initiative. My Lord, it's an initiative promoted by Honorable Dennis Waweru and Honorable Junet Muhammad. To demonstrate that point, my Lord, I invite you to look at Volume 7, page 31110 and 31117. The affidavit of Dennis Waweru. In that affidavit, paragraph 1, paragraph 18, and paragraph 19 and 29 are very clear. Honorable Dennis Waweru says that I and Honorable Junet Muhammad are the promoters of this initiative. He then describes how they engage with the IBC and describes how they collected the signatures. My Lord, that affidavit was uncontroverted. How do you ignore such a fundamental statement? My Lord, I invite you again so, sorry, Council, you say that affidavit is at page? Page, uh, volume 7, page 31110 to page 3117. Particularly, my Lord, paragraph 1, paragraph 18, 19, and 29. My Lord, a popular initiative, and we want to reiterate that, starts at the point in which the promoter having generated an idea has reduced that idea into a bill it is important to note that under article 157.3 whatever ideas you have you cannot present those ideas for a referendum or for a vote you must reduce them into a bill and once you reduce them into a bill you must collect one million signatures it is at that point that the initiative starts. My Lord, you will see from the letter to the IEBC, signed by the two gentlemen, dated 18th November 2020. It is in volume 7, page 3154. 3154. That they initiate the process. That is where the popular initiative started. They wrote to IBC and said, we have developed a bill. We want to collect signatures. The IBC accepted them as the promoters, not anyone else. And the letter from the IBC is dated 24th November 2020. It is in the same volume, volume 7 page 3156, 3156. They were then authorized to collect signatures, which they did. My Lord, having duly complied and submitted those signatures to the IBC, the IBC then did a letter to the counties 
as is required by the Constitution. That is the letter dated 26th January 2021. Forwarding the bill, that letter is in volume 4, volume 4 of appeal, page 1884. And it expressly confirms to the counties who the promoters are. My Lord, I also invite you to have a look at page 1823. Page 1823. And on that page, the IBC says in paragraph 1, the said initiative was promoted by Honorable Dennis Waweru and Honorable Junet Muhammad. Paragraph 1, page 1823. My Lord, without a doubt, the promoters of this initiative are the two gentlemen described. That submission was made to the Superior Court, my Lord, but the court ignored it without comment. That submission is in volume 1, page 90, paragraph 133. Indeed, my lords, as we'll notice in the additional evidence supplied by the Third Way Alliance, in this case, the JLAC report, it will be noted that the two gentlemen again appeared before Parliament as promoters and were accepted as such. My last point on this, my lord, a lot of argument has been made in respect of a task force, in respect of a select committee, and, uh, and otherwise. My Lord, let it be on record that the task force was in place between 24th May 2018 to October 2019, and the select committee between 10th January 2020 and 30th June 2020. As of 30th June 2020, there was no task force, there was no select committee. And an effort to tie those two bodies to this initiative is therefore futile. Well, let me move to the next point. Uh, can the president initiate a popular initiative? Our position is that in this case the president did not, but nothing in law stops the president from doing that. There are a number of reasons, but I'll move over them very quickly. Uh, other than the fact, and this was submitted by Mr. Karori yesterday, that in terms of the Constitution, there is nothing on the face of the Constitution that stops the President. But I wish to draw your attention to Article 27 and Article 38.1 of the Constitution. But Lord, Article 27 speaks to equal protection of every person, including the President, equal protection of the law. But more importantly, my Lord, which was not considered by the court, is the political rights under Article 38.1c. It allows any person and every citizen of the right to campaign for a political party or cause, and the catchphrase is cause. You can campaign for any cause. And the issue here, my Lord, is that these two provisions are in the Bill of Rights. Are they limited in terms of excluding the president. If they are to be limited, you must come to Article 24. And Article 24 requires that to limit any right, it must be limited by law. In this case, read legislation. Is there any legislation that limits the president from this initiative? The answer is no. If there was to be any legislation, then again, the court would be called upon to look at it and determine whether it is reasonable in an open and democratic society. My Lord, my Lord friend Mr. Karori explained yesterday that the misconception in the judgment is the supposition that the president is in control of parliament, and that is true. It supposes that to be president, you'll always be in a party that is majority in parliament. It is a misconception of a presidential system. You can actually be in the minority. 
but it can be worse. You can actually have no parliamentary party because our constitution allows an independent to be president. So can it be said in fairness that you as president, your only avenue is parliament where you may not even have a party? That is a misconception a lot, especially given the role of the president in terms of national unity and fostering um, uh, unity. Thank you, my lord. In order, therefore, to create that distinction and having realized that the president cannot, was not the promoter, the court then coins a term, initiator. That would be found, my lord, in uh, volume 1, page 80, paragraph 104 and 105, and in the findings, Roman 8. My lord, there is no such word as initiator in Article 257. There is only the promoters and the supporters. And with respect, this word then is used in the judgment to camouflage the difficulty in identifying the promoters. My third point, my lord, the process. Sorry, oh, and sorry. I wanted to know that you have uh, just like four minutes to go. If you want senior counsel, Kamboni to take about 30 minutes. Well, we had already agreed that senior counsel Kambuni will take 20 minutes between okay. 15 and 20. Okay. So I'll run through the rest very quickly. My Lord, before you do that, before sorry. you you run, uh, yes. do you want to comment about the question of uh, conflict? It, it is. Yes. Yeah. I am happy to make that clarification, my Lord. The court finds that the role of the president as initiator will be in conflict because after the document is passed it then goes to the president with respect my lord that is an erroneous analysis for two reasons one is that the role of the president at that stage is not substantive it is ceremonial the constitution is clear that once it leaves parliament for a popular initiative whether parliament endorses or not as long as it has con you know aspects that require a referendum then it will be forwarded to the ibc so there cannot be a conflict where your role is ceremonial in that situation but also my lord secondly because for a popular initiative such as this that has clauses requiring a referendum it is not the president that determines whether it becomes law. It is the people. So the president has no meaningful role in this process because it goes to the people in a referendum. And therefore to create an appearance of conflict, my lord, is wrong. My lord, let me talk about the process of popular initiative. Uh, just a moment, please. Yes. Sorry. Uh, thank you, senior counsel. I'm just wondering, you say the judges came up with a term called initiator. Yes. Uh, did they identify the basis upon which they said he initiated? My Lord, with respect, what the Superior Court does is analyze a history that is not relevant to the issue before the court. No, no, uh, that's okay. About relevant. And they do not. Cancel. They do not. They don't say why they call him initiator? They do not, sir. At all? They do not. They just introduce that term in the course of the analysis. Okay. Council. Uh, yes, my lord. Yes. Now, uh, there were submissions made yesterday uh, about the background to the pop popular initiative clause. Yes, my lord. And one that was made was uh, that there was a culture of hyper amendments yes, in the uh, pre-2010 constitution. Yes, now, the argument you made that any person, including a member of the executive, can be fall in the bracket of the people under Article 257. Yes, and you have made a further argument in respect to the political rights of members of the executive. Yes, now given, and I've looked at your submissions, 
in which you also invite us to look at that historical historical perspective. I think it is point three point three point eight. Uh, given the history of and uh, the reasons behind Article two fifty seven, when a member of the executive decides to be a promoter under Article 257, must he then cast aside his official or formal uh, clothing as a member of the executive, i.e., would there be a restriction? Can he promote in his capacity as a member of the executive, or must he first step aside in respect of not from the office, but express that view as a politician, whether through his party or if he's an from an independent candidate as a politician. Thank you. My Lord, in our analysis, and we've captured this in our submission, the root of popular initiative was a root that was coined to be an alternative to parliament where you had or you could have a rogue parliament that becomes a stumbling block to meaningful reforms that are helpful to the people. On its face, there is nothing to suggest, not even in the history, and I invite you to even look at the report of the Committee of Experts, that it is a route that is unavailable to the executive. There is nothing on the face of it or on history that excludes the executive. And it is for good reason, my lord. You can have a president who is popular and is elected by the people. But you can have a parliament, and it happens in our counties, a parliament that is hostile to that president. And if that president wants to make changes that are helpful to the people, how do they do it then? They may have been elected on a certain platform of change, and they want to effect that change. You must allow them that if parliament cannot help them make that change, they go directly to the people and they initiate it. Therefore, in that event, even though it's not the case here, there would be nothing to step away from. My Lord, quickly on the stipulations of the process. We want to submit, and we made this point, that Article 257 on its face is onerous. It is a principle of constitution making that when you should make a constitution that is not too easy to amend, but not impossible to amend. And that is the balance that Article 257 strikes. To amend under popular initiative, there are 14 onerous provisions that you require, and they are in our replying submissions. My Lord, they are onerous but possible. We wish to submit, my Lord, that in substitution of that 14-point process, the Superior Court then replaces that with 10 points which are impossible to achieve, completely impossible. And I'll go through them very fast. My Lord, first, the Court says that it is Wanjiku who must conceive the idea. Under Article 257.3, once Wanjiku conceives the idea, then they must reduce it into a bill. That ordinary person must now write the technical bill. Without a census of the Kenya Law Reform Commission, the Attorney General's Office, Parliament, or anyone, Wanjiku must write that bill. Having written that bill, then Wanjiku must translate that bill into English, into Swahili, into Braille, into Kenya Sign Language and into all the indigenous languages. Those are the words of the judgment. Wanjiku must translate those. Even the Bible has not been translated into all the constitutions. My Lord, even when we were writing the constitution that is now before us, we only translated it into English and Swahili. But the court now says, translate it into all the indigenous languages. And you know, my Lord, We've never even settled how many indigenous communities we have in this country. Some say, if it's tribes, we have about 44. But if it's indigenous communities, they're about 76. So Wanjiku is supposed to do all this. 
Then Wanjiku, my lord, thirdly, must make sufficient copies to distribute. My lord will note that the judgment says that the committee of experts did not make sufficient copies. You will see that in volume 4 of the digest, page 1566 to 1567. And yet, my lord, the committee of experts made 6.9 million copies. So Wanjiku must make more than 6.9 million copies. My lord, that is not enough. Wanjiku must then do civic education. That is the fourth stage. And given the earlier finding, that civic education must also be in the languages that is understood by those people. This same Wanjiku, number five, will then present this bill to the IEBC as a promoter. But before presenting it, there, there's another requirement. One, Wanjiku must ensure that the IEBC has undertaken national registration of voters because the court finds that you cannot do a referendum before IEBC does that. Wanjiku must also ensure secondly on that question that they seek the opinion of the court whether the amendments are basic structure or not and I spoke to that earlier. Wanjiku must ensure thirdly that in seeking that opinion and without either being national government or county government or state organ they somehow get the audience of the Supreme Court it is not stated how but my lad, that all in terms of presentation to the IBC there's a sixth other once it is presented and you know the bill has been generated by Wanjiku and there is no obligation for IBC to, ha to help Wanjiku anywhere then Wanjiku must provide sufficient copies of the bill sufficient enough to be distributed to the 47 counties enough for those counties to also undertake public participation and then Wanjiku number 7 will then traverse the 47 counties talking to them and persuading them so that at least 24 out of 47 can endorse the bill in order to move forward that is the seventh step if Wanjiku overcomes that then now the bill is sent to the two houses of parliament the senate and the national assembly and that's the eighth step at that point Wanjiku must engage with the two houses during their public participation to explain and undertake public participation and persuade them to endorse it having done that if it passes or fails Wanjiku must then engage with the president and the IBC in terms of the timelines that uh, are provided and then lastly Wanjiku must then traverse the county and persuade us to vote yes my lord we wish to submit that those prescriptions are utopic they are impossible to achieve they supplant what is in the constitution for what is impossible to achieve my lord verification yeah, Sorry, before, before you finish, you have uh, outlined the difficulties. <coughs> Sorry. You have outlined the difficulties Wanjiku is likely to encounter should she be the initiator. And yesterday we were told here that Wanjiku can exercise that right or through uh, personally or through the, the elected. So can you try us uh, tie that out? Because what we are representing now is as if she can never do that on her own. It is unsurmountable. But yesterday we were told she can sit back and then exercise that right through other bodies within the constitution and she will be perfectly in order. Thank you. My Lord, we are saying two things and I quite agree with you. We are saying first that if we follow what on the face of Article 257, it is possible for Wanjiku to achieve. It is onerous but possible. But what is in 257 is what's being supplanted by the decision of the court. 
And it is this line by the decision of the court that would be impossible to achieve. But if we follow what's in Article 257, it is possible to achieve with the ultimate end that Wanjiku will put the final stamp in a referendum. That is our submission. My Lord, just one word in terms of verification. Uh, in terms of verification, my Lord, what IBC is required to verify is one million registered voters that they support the initiative, not one million signatures. My Lord, the court goes to an earlier document which talked of signatures without noting that the wording of Article 257 changed from 1 million signatures to 1 million registered voters. Our submission on that, without going into too much detail, is that the court was obligated to look on the express text of the Constitution as it is now, not on the contents of an historical proposal that was rejected. How do you, how do you um, verify those voters? I mean, supposing someone were to go and pick one million names who are on the register and present them, how does IBC verify that indeed those people are supporting that initiative? Thank how you, do they Lord. do that? Thank you, my Lord. My Lord, that issue, and I invite you, I thank, uh, thankfully, that analysis is made in the Justice and Legal Affairs report at page 28. But what we will see from that report that the IBC stated that it uses what it calls unique identifiers. That in our system right now, you are not just identified by your signature. There are other unique identifiers. And when my Lord then consider that report, uh, you will see that the question of signatures was only one of the others. In our situation, my Lord, and especially in the, this context, it is to be noted that there were over one million, uh, over four million signatures. Not a single person, despite the publication by ABC, came out to complain that my name was put there erroneously. Council, yes, my uh, lord. Please assist me. You see, it's my business yes. to understand this thing, and I want to know how is that process a verification other than just having the numbers and perhaps ID numbers which are easy to get from from IBC from the voters register how does one verify that those are actually supporters this thing called unique identifiers sitting here I have absolutely no idea what that is what are those unique identifiers my lord for this context and without going to the theoretical aspect because of time in this context, the submission by IBC, which is captured in the JLAG report, is that once the supporters come with a list of names, the IBC then publishes it to the public, just so that in case it is alleged that a name was included wrongfully, and it is not you, then you would complain. That way, it would verify and check that that name is wrongly put there. The so, council, yes, my Lord. Parliament may have been quite happy to be told by IBC yes. we have unique identifiers and they don't follow it further. But for me sitting here, if you tell me that there are unique identifiers, I need to be satisfied. And that's what I'm asking you. What are those unique identifiers? My Lord, uh, my learned friend, uh, Professor Gidu Mugai, says they'll deal with that. Because of my time, I will not go into the detail. What is sufficient for this purpose, my Lord? I'll be I'll wait. Yes. Thank you is that you cannot place undue substance on the question of signatures when in the first place the law does not require every Kenyan to have a signature. When in the second place there is no repository of signatures. And that the undue uh, you know, elevation of the question of signatures when it's not required is what's wrong. But I'll allow the team from IBC to deal with that. But now, on the question of quorum, it was dealt with. All I wish to say on it are two quick things. One, that my Lord, you cannot elevate a provision in a schedule of an act to essentially amend 
the constitution by providing a higher minimum number of commissioners than is provided in the constitution. But secondly, my lord, you will also note that this matter had already been dealt with by a court of concurrent jurisdiction, that is Justice Okwan, and that is on volume one of page 133, where the court affirmed that the IBC had quorum. And what's important, my lord, is that the superior court in this case paid no difference to that finding. My lord, lastly, is on the question of multiple questions, and I just want to submit very quickly, my lord, one, that the entirety of Article 257 in terms of the bill deals in the singular. And my lord, you'll see from sub-article 1 to 10, it says, ah, there, it. In all those instances, it refers to the bill, not to the questions. Because whatever suggestion you have under Article 257.3, you must reduce it to a bill, a bill. Council, yes. I'm at 257 with you. 257.1, is it dealing with a bill or is it dealing with an amendment? My Lord, let us go through 257 yes. from 1 to 3. One is the one that gives the avenue of amendment by popular initiative, an amendment to distinguish it from the one by parliament. Under two, it allows two possibilities. You can come with a bill, and where you get it is relevant, or you could come with a suggestion or suggestions. But if there are suggestions, and that's the important aspect, you cannot bring those suggestions to a, a referendum. You must reduce them to a bill. Okay? Under three. It, and the word is shall. You shall formulate it into a draft bill. Not draft bills. A draft bill. Whatever it is. And we can demonstrate that. But Lord, when you continue, and even the question that was posed yesterday in sabbatical 10, whenever you talk of it, there, ah, it refers not to a question, and learned senior Mr. Rengo submitted on this yesterday. The rosy idea that you can bring questions to a referendum is one that arises from the Elections Act, section 49, and it allows the possibility that you could pose a question, should Kenya still remain within the East African community, as a question. But when it comes to an amendment, there is no such latitude you must reduce it into a bill and it is that bill a bill the bill that is considered it does not allow of the possibility of multiple questions the corollary to that my lord and i invite you to look at the finding by justice ochien in the case of titus as lila volume 6 page 2650 all the way to 2656 uh, where he makes two important findings one that Article 257 itself is a complete framework. It does not require anything else to enable it. It is complete. And in fact, he goes ahead to find that to try and direct IBC on how to undertake a referendum is a usurpation of their jurisdiction. Mr. Alkin, do you still intend to give uh, your other counsel 20 minutes? I am now two minutes and I'm done, my lord. Uh, I think it's the questions that... Uh, Two minutes. Well, it is also to be noted that the court failed to take judicial notice, although it was submitted, that there is a referendum bill. And that referendum bill is produced in the uh, reply to the additional evidence. And in detail, without explaining, it demonstrates why you cannot, why Parliament adopted the view that you cannot have multiple referendum questions. Indeed, my lord, if you were to accept that you are to have re multiple referendum questions, then it cannot only be for the voter at the referendum. Will you have those multiple referendum questions to the counties? Will you have them to parliament when they are considering it? The answer is no. It would result in unimaginable difficulties and you would not have a constitution. My lord, lastly, 
is to say that um, the JLAC report that is annexed is not a finding as submitted by the, uh, by the respondents, but as shown on its face, there are notes which were meant to assist members of parliament in making a determination whether to vote yes or no, or no. And there are notes that contain the majority view of parliamentarians and the minority view. And it is a document that did not require and was not adopted by parliament. It is of no probative value for this discussion, except for academic purposes. But to that extent, and all this is captured in our reply, on all eight material points that the court found on, the JLAC report found to the contrary. My Lord, I now wish to invite my colleague, uh, Senior Counsel Lucy Camboni, to continue. Thank you. Um, uh, my ladies, thank you very much. Firstly, it's a plea for five minutes because I have been gesturing there. I thought um, your lordship will ask me whether 